Since I started working there in 2014, it's only improved as the years have gone by. We had 56% female mixed non-binary in 22. We achieved 51% female mixed non-binary in 21. We had um, mixed male-female headliners in both those years. Um, and we have a track record of giving um, new, kind of giving artists their first ever festival headline performance. I think in the last, as of 2021, in the last six years, 50% of our headliners, it was their first ever festival headline show. Thank you. Is there fear in, uh, across festivals in general, uh, and to broaden it out from just picking on you, and I apologize for that, is there a fear that more female artists would lead to a loss in revenue? Or is it the challenge that you don't have the artists signed, you don't have the pipeline, you have the uh, album cycles, etc. all sort of comes together and it's not about revenue, it's about being able to find those artists in the first place? I think at the top, on the headliners, it, it, is, about, it is about all the things that I just discussed. Um, on the lineup further down the bill, there's a lot less excuses. There's so much incredible female talent out there that you would have to not be doing your job to find them. Um, but in terms of an act that can hold a crowd for 13 and a half thousand people, um, that takes time to come through. And that takes money and effort and attention across all areas of the industry. Thank you. Um, do you think that there should be any responsibility on festivals to make sure that their lineups are balanced absolutely and how much of that is incumbent on the bigger festivals um i am not sure i can particularly comment on that um because i'm just here representing end of the road and the association okay. of independent festivals you feel that the association of independent festivals is making a real effort yes is that matched by other organizations well i mean the stats would say no thank you uh, and i'm sorry all of my questions are directed to you and i apologize we will bring in the other witnesses fret not um i just want to understand whether exclusivity agreements uh that might exist for some artists make it harder to have balanced lineups yes because if we talk about the talent pool at the top that is capable of headlining a massive show um, and it's not in any particular year, it could vary, there could be lots of people on an album cycle and the pool is very rich but um, it definitely diminishes the chances of, of artists being able to headline multiple events so those with bigger budgets and more money have first dibs, I suppose. And do you think that there should be any um, responsibility, or maybe on artists themselves, or organisers, or both, to say no to exclusivity agreements? Or are they just a fact of life that, that need to be accepted? I think within the industry, there seems to be an acceptance that exclusivity on headliners um, is something that we all understand um, but lower down the bill is where it gets more complicated. Um, exclusivity on headliners is problematic for us um, largely because it comes from major festivals as opposed to other independents um, but your headliner is your headliners um, a lot of the time they're selling your tickets so you need to kind of own that uniqueness um, but luckily I mean end of the road has always sold to its whole lineup we normally sell a third of tickets before we even announce um, and we have a very loyal audience they like coming to us just because they like the festival thank you can I just bring Kate in on headliners in particular yeah I mean you've just actually answered part of what I was going to ask you there. I wondered whether you monitored gender or sex of the people that come to your festivals that buy the tickets and uh, how much, if any, impact not having a woman as a headliner might have on that. You know, are you, are you aware of that? I know you said that people come in, buy tickets for the whole lineup. Um, 
but I would I I would imagine that there's a certain there's obviously a certain draw for the headline acts more so. Um, I don't have those stats to hand, but um, I'm happy to provide them after the fact in writing. Do you do you actually capture those? Yes. Those figures. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Chair, and thank you for, for joining us today. My questions it really relate to Primavera, so they're going to be directed to, to Marta, but feel free to, to jump in if you want to add anything, uh, John and Lauren. So, um, Marta, I have to be honest, I, um, I'm not really a music goer. However, um, I do know of the hard work that you and the team have been doing. Um, and I'm really wanting to pick at it a little bit more and gain more of an understanding of how this came about. Um, but then also, what have been your challenges in achieving that 50-50 lineup? First of all, thanks so much for, for having me, for having us uh, here, because it's such an honour uh, to belong to a festival which is not from the UK and being able to be here and explain how we've been doing this um, in a journey that started in 2018. In 2018, almost without noticing, we achieved around 30% of female representation uh, in Primavera Sound. And we just noticed when the festival was over. And then we thought, okay, if we achieve this 30, 33% of female representation without even noticing, what if we tried? What if we really tried to do it and next year, 2019, uh, we achieve what we called back then the new normal, which was it should be absolutely normal to have 50% of uh, women or non-binary acts or whatever. That doesn't mean to have only white men with guitars on stage. So uh, that year, the, mm, the challenges were uh, just being in that mindset uh, somehow and uh, trying to fill in all the, all the slots, as uh, Lauren was saying. Um, headliners might uh, be more difficult uh, some years depending on um, the roots that they might have, if they have released a record or not. But we've always believed that somehow headliners are also what you call a headliner. It's not like a computer that you just bought and it comes with X uh, gigabytes of memory. She is a headliner if you put her on that slot. Um, it's a very um, usual example that I always uh, talk about. Solange, uh, she had been to the festival before and she was uh, occupying lower spaces on, on the poster. And then we thought, she should be a headliner, why not? Uh, we've seen her career growing. We think that our, our audience um, might enjoy this and we are pretty much sure that she deserves to be on, on this lot. Or Rosalia, who's coming back this year after playing several times in Primavera. And the last time, she was already a headliner. So the, the challenges are for us basically right now that we are competing against ourselves. Because we are here because we put a, a spotlight on us. So now we know that we have to live up to the memory, which is not a memory. It's mm. a... Mm -hmm. and so how will you overcome those challenges? Because it sounds like within the, the team at Primavera that there seems to be a cultural attitude where why isn't this the new normal? Um, and why can't we have 50-50 lineups? So moving forward, how do you think you're going to overcome those barriers? I think that um, an important uh, clue is also to have a very diverse team. It's, uh, it's really important that uh, in our company, in any company. We are also 50-50 men and female that we have several heads of, uh, of department. Uh, we have a radio station. She is uh, a director, uh, the coordinator of the booking department. She is also a woman. In logistics, we have a woman uh, in charge of press and uh, NPR. <coughs> it's me. So I think that, first of all, it's very important that you look inwards and you and then you might think, okay, are we doing what we can really do in our company? Because if all the company is only white people, which in our case, that's something that we really need uh, to, to improve because we don't have enough uh, racial diverse uh, stuff yet. 
Um, do we have enough uh, people from the LGBTQ um, uh, community? Do we have enough women? Do we have enough uh, non-binary people? And then it is easier to think different. And then also that means that our audience is going to be different. They are going to ask different things from us and then we will be able to deliver. But it's not something that comes just from one day to, to another. The challenges keep, keep changing. Yeah. If you pardon the pun, this is all music to my ears. Um, <laughs> I thought that was quite funny as well. Um, so I'm curious to learn a little bit more about what feedback you've gained from, from the general public, from artists and bookers, from having this 50-50 lineup. I won't lie, uh, 2019 was hell on earth yeah. at the beginning. Uh, when we released the, the lineup, uh, we had a tremendous backlash, especially online, which of course, it's very easy and cheap to do. Um, we feel that many, many people that uh, felt Primavera Sound as something of their own, felt betrayed, uh, this is not appealing to me anymore, this is not the, the festival that I used to attend, and then we started receiving all this backlash saying, uh, this is only a PR stunt, you are not a music, fe you are a music festival, you are not uh, a women's committee, why are you doing this, we only care about music, um, and we received a lot of criticism online. Uh, just after this first wave, we started receiving praise and more praise and more praise, especially from people that had never attended a music festival before because they didn't feel safe, because uh, the music that was displayed in music festivals wasn't the music that they were listening to in their bedrooms. Um, maybe because um, they, they thought, yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in this. So then we started receiving a lot of comments um, from very young gay boys that said, yes, I'm going to come because my friends are also coming and I think that I will feel safe in this festival. And I think that's something that is going to be also uh, talked about in this committee, about safety in, uh, in our festivals. We started receiving praise about, okay, I really love this band and it's really small, but now I feel that you have programmed these girls that are doing music the way I would like to do music as well, if, if I can do it at some point. And then... Um, also answering a, a question that uh, she, she asked first. The proof that this works is that for the first time, um, in one year that we had more audience than ever, we usually sold out. But that year, uh, we have increased our capacity. So on that Thursday, we had uh, about, I don't know, 60,000 people, more or less, Friday as well. On Saturday, we sold out with 65,000 people with a lineup that portrayed a classical, let's say, indie act uh, with a white guy, James Blake, the biggest Latino superstar from reggaeton Colombia, J Balvin, and a girl from Barcelona, Rosalia. That's diversity. And we sold out the festival with increased capacity for the first time ever. So it works. So if you want to look at it financially, it works. So you're not seeing a reduction in tickets? Uh, no, 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 no. And in fact, you're increasing capacity. That's really interesting. You, you said something there that I want to pick up on. You said that young gay boys have anecdotally said that they feel safe there. Do you think, because we've, in committee, have heard evidence from women in different parts of the music industry who have very often spoke about their experiences that they don't feel safe more often than not. Do you think having not just a 50-50 lineup, but having a gender balanced uh, workforce has created a safe space at this concert? Absolutely. Uh, because then you think differently. Because if you only have men on your staff, they typically don't feel unsafe unless they are um, um, from LGBTQ communities. If you only have straight guys in your company, it's difficult that they have felt threatened. But if you have lots of women in your company, if you have uh, people from diverse um, uh, social uh, backgrounds, it's probable that you have felt unsafe, that you have felt scared going back home, that uh, you were lost between stages and you didn't find your friends. So then when you're uh, able to work on this other side of the business, you think about that. 
And if you try to create the festival that you would like to attend as, a, as an audience, you have those things in mind. Yeah, Absolutely. No, for sure. In a lot of these kind of major festivals will sell out well in advance um, of the lineup actually being announced. So do you think this has created a sense of complacency amongst um, organisations when they're having a gender balance or potentially looking at having a gender balanced lineup? Could be. Absolutely. The problem is that, uh, as uh, we say in Spain, esto es pan para hoy, hambre para mañana, which means I'm going to have bread today, but I'm going to be hungry tomorrow. If we don't change the ways that we use to do things, at some point our audiences are going to, be st uh, are going to stay at home. We grow old, we have kids, we don't have the energy anymore. If we would just try to cater to the audience that used to buy the tickets, at some point they won't be there anymore. And by the time that we try to change the lineups to appeal to someone different, you will be so far away, the train has passed. So if we still working, we still work the way that we used to, um, those uh, sold outs won't be there anymore. Yes. You've kind of just answered my last question there, but I'm going to ask it um, just for a more, in a more specific manner. Um, if having a gender balanced lineup doesn't increase Sale, sale tickets, you have said it increases sale tickets, but if that's not a factor, why should organisations and other festivals have gender balanced lineups? What, what positives have you seen from that uh, since 2019? Why should any company have uh, gender balanced staff? Just yesterday, the Spanish government passed a law that uh, forces companies in IBEX 35, those are uh, the, the companies in um, in, uh, in public offer. Also governments, also uh, el uh, electoral uh, candidacies um, and any kind of public organism to have at least 40% of women uh, on their staffs. That was a law that was passed just yesterday. I still wonder why this doesn't apply to many other things. I understand that this can't be uh, directed to smaller companies, um, but for example, I think that um, that yeah, um, holding uh, holding um, big companies accountable matters, and then if that happens with uh, finances and uh, you know this kind of um, of businesses, why not um, why not festivals? We we should do it because we just have to if we want to be. Um, the mirror of, of our society. I think so. Marta, thank you so much. I did say at the start that I'm not really a festival goer, but I think you've convinced me otherwise. Thank you. My mission here is done. <laughs> <laughs> Marta, can I just ask the same question that I think Kate asked Lauren about when it comes to, to ticket sales? Do you know what your audience gender breakdown is? And, and would you know that on advanced ticket sales? So before people even know the lineup, do you know whether it's 50-50 or? We are actually in 50-50. Uh, I think that last year it was even a little bit higher on uh, female attendance. Thank you. And uh, this might be commercially sensitive, you don't have to volunteer this information, but what percentage of your sales happen before you've released your lineup? It uh, depends a lot. Last year it was crazy because of course uh, Primavera didn't happen for two yeah. editions, 2020 and 2021. So what we did was a double edition for two weekends and we sold out uh, for a festival or a double edition that was 10 days long. So it really depends a lot. This year we have two uh, editions in Spain, one in Barcelona, which is actually going to happen next week, and another one in Madrid the week after. So this year is a little bit different. Uh, let's say, I don't know, maybe um, I'm just from the top of my head, maybe 35 to 40 percent uh, this year was uh, before announcing the, the lineup. Last year uh, it was absolutely everything before announcing and it was a double edition. Thank you and can I particularly thank you for coming over no, uh, when it's the festival next week. <laughs> Kim? Actually, and to be, to be clear, I'm uh, on maternity leave. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's why my colleagues are not missing me and I'm, I'm happy to, to be here. Thank, Thank you. you, Kim. <laughs>
Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, panel. I um, just want to pick up on the issues about women's safety at live music, and my questions are directed at John. The Musicians' Union, John, describes sexual harassment at live music events as being shockingly normalised and seen as an occupational hazard. So what do you think are the major barriers to reporting sexual harassment and assault at music festivals, and what should be done to challenge it? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, we ran a survey in 2019 to our members looking specifically at people who'd experienced sexual harassment and we had over 800 responses to that survey. Um, almost half of the members who responded had experienced sexual harassment and over 60% had witnessed someone experience sexual harassment. To your point, um, 40, um, over 85% of the people who'd experienced sexual harassment didn't report it. Mm. And the biggest barrier was fear of losing work um, or workplace culture was cited as a barrier. And the fear of using, losing work is a unique aspect that I think makes sexual harassment more likely and underreported in the music industry. So our members all work in a range of uh, venues, pubs, festival sites where alcohol and drug consumption is more likely. There's really informal work and practices. Employment relies on networks. So you can see as these um, kind of um, ways of working add up, it creates a culture where sexual harassment is more likely to happen and more likely to go underreported as well. Um, so they're the main reasons that members don't report it for fear of losing work and that workplace culture. What we'd like to see happen, the MU are in fully support, fully support of the Work Protection Bill, especially the third party harassment protections as well. I think it was, um, I've got the stats somewhere here, it was 47% of members have been sexually harassed by an audience member. So those third party protections are a really important part of that legislation to our members. So we're in full support of that. And we think that's an important step in creating safe workplaces for our members. Um, if we just go back, um, tackling and preventing sexual harassment. So we have a service called Safe Space, which is open to the entire music industry, and that is set up specifically where anyone can report instances of sexual harassment or abuse in the music industry. And through that, we're able to provide legal advice and support where appropriate, or signpost to support services where we can't support. Um, John, what we, can I just ask, is that um, information readily available and easily available to everybody? Safe yes, space, yeah. it is, and we work with venues and festivals to make sure that, that um, there's posters up in dressing rooms or rehearsal spaces to make sure that that service is known. But I will say there's massive gaps there where, where women just don't know that service exists or don't feel that they can access it for numerous reasons. Mm -hmm. This is why we're also supportive of the Creative Independent Standards Authority. We think that's a necessary step that will plug that gaps and help change the culture of the music industry or support the industry to change culture. Um, We'd like to see more of the work to uh, provide visible reporting mechanisms at festivals and live music venues and train them for security and people working at the venues as well. So they've got more of an education on how to respond to reports of sexual harassment. Um, and see more festivals engage with the initiatives like uh, Safer Spaces, mm -hmm. what I know Lauren will be able to tell you more about, um, that provides physical safe spaces at events and festivals and that's specialised support for people who have experienced those behaviours there as well. You just mentioned about um, providing more training for security staff. Yeah. What, um, how does that take place and who's responsible for delivering that? Because that is often one of the, the major barriers, isn't it? Yes. You know, in terms of um, security staff maybe not acting mm -hmm. um, responsibly enough and, um, um, and speedily enough, yeah. you know, in terms of challenging these incidents. Definitely, it's a massive gap and we've mm -hmm. worked out with Good Night Out, too, I'm sure you've all heard of Good Night Out campaign and they will provide training like that. There's various training providers, if I'm honest, that could provide wider equality, diversity, inclusion training, but specifically on how to respond to instances of sexual harassment. I think that's a crucial part as well, So, and the report mechanism to go along with that. So where something is reported, it's logged, and we can start to build a picture of, is this venue specifically a problem where we have sexual harassment commonly, and how do we address that? That's an important part of the puzzle of fixing this culture as well. And is that one of the problems also, John, in terms of the reporting mechanisms, you know, in terms of um, artists and women attending live music events, knowing what and where they can go to do that? Absolutely, and it's complicated for that. Most of the people who are working in the industry are freelancers as well. Again, so there won't necessarily be a HR department or a, re or a report mechanism in place in a lot of places, but where they are in in place. Um, we do see reports obviously, but again there's still those barriers of worrying about what's the consequences for reporting. Um, that's why I think an anonymous report mechanism is really important as well. 
And so artists, you know, um, performing at live events won't, won't have access to appropriate facilities. You know, and I don't know whether you see that also as a barrier in terms of getting more women involved in these events. Definitely. It's when we've had a workforce that's been historically dominated by men, then women are often at the fore. So we've had reports where women are, there's no change in facilities for women at venues. So women will be getting changed in cars, mm -hmm. in, which obviously raises safety concerns, or they'll be asked to share a dressing room with the rest of the band members and things like that. Um, so there's multiple issues going on there where it creates quite an unwelcome environment for women. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, sorry, your union has 30,000 members. What is the breakdown in terms of gender, in terms We're of We're about membership? N approaching 40% women, women of membership, yeah, and we do lots of work to ensure that we recruit more women, that we've got services specifically for women, like Safe Space or the maternity services that we provide. Um, and also we may do a lot of work to make sure our committees are 50-50 splits as well. Uh -huh. Thanks very much, John. Thank My you. next question is for Marta and Lauren, and it's very much about what men are doing, what you're doing with men to call out and um, challenge these behaviours at live festivals because until men stand up and challenge then a lot of these incidents continue don't they? Lauren? Um, well part of the um, Safer Spaces Charter which was um, originally launched in 2017 and relaunched in 2022 um, part of it is to raise greater awareness about sexual violence at festivals. Um, part of it was to t take a survivor-led approach to tackling sexual violence. And a lot of it was to spread um, information about being an active bystander and about consent. Um, and so there are the kind of the five Ds of being an active bystander, which we train um, all our heads of department and they in turn train um, our stewards and bar staff on. And that's a really, really important place, I think, to start with, with the men that we work with that attend the event as staff or artists or performers <coughs> or anyone. Um, and that's a resource that's easily available online. It was devised by right to be. Um, so that's like probably one of the, the most important ways. Um, and I think a lot of it probably comes back to, I suppose everything that kind of Marta was saying in terms of representation, it's about ensuring that your workforce is diverse. And so you have the opinions of people from multiple different backgrounds feeding into the situations and feeding into what is the right or wrong way to do things. Mm -hmm. And kind of going back to the point I raised before that your survey identified the issue as being normalised and just an occupational hazard. So it's about um, providing information, isn't it, to all of the people involved in the festivals to ensure that they know that um, this is a serious incident that needs to be reporting. Same over to you, Marta, in terms of what you do in terms of your respective festivals, in terms of you know, asking men to call out sexual violence. We started in 2018 with a protocol that was developed by the Barcelona Town Hall mm -hmm. and it was a protocol against uh, sexual harassment mm -hmm. in uh, nightlife uh, venues and festivals. We were the first ones to implement that, that protocol mm -hmm. together with uh, several venues and the Barcelona Town Hall. And in 2019, uh, together with this campaign of the new normal, we kind of uh, spread the scope. Mm -hmm. And we made a new protocol by ourselves, which it was called Nobody is Normal. Because what is to be normal nowadays? So it's not only against sexual harassment, but also a celebration of diversity. It's a, a protocol against fear. Um, a festival is a space for transgression, uh, for community, for celebration, and no one should be afraid of expressing uh, her own, his own, or them, themselves in, in a music festival. So just a couple of days ago, we announced again the, the protocol that um, uh, has different aspects. For example, the, the safe spaces in the festival where you can just go and stay for a while, or you can go and report anything that might have happened to you or that you might have witnessed. We have uh, some stuff that's walking around the, the venue. And I, I want to stress how important it is, um, in line of uh, what John was saying, that this has to be um, f 
felt as something that is non, not threatening. So this stuff is composed by so many diverse people in terms of race, uh, of physicalities, of uh, sexual orientation. So me as a woman or a guy or whoever is feeling unsafe can feel that these people will listen to, to them. And also our staff is, is trained as well in order to detect any possible uh, conflicts. I think, however, that everything is linked. So the more we invest in uh, gender balance lineups, more diverse our audience is going to be, mm -hmm. and then the safer is going to be for for everyone. Let's let's uh, say that um, an anti-sexual uh, harassment protocol, the goal is for it to disappear, so we don't have to use it anymore. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, panel. There are all my questions. Thank you. John, can I just go back uh, to what you were saying, uh, specifically about venues? Mm -hmm. So if the Musicians' Union kind of gets wind that there's a particular venue where people are unsafe, where there are more reports of sexual harassment, abuse, assaults, what do you actually do? How do you as a union go about tackling that with the venue? Okay. So it's first important just to say that the, the safe space service where people report that through, that's survivor-led. So we'll always be led by the survivor if they want to take action or not. But to your point, if we got multiple reports yeah. about a venue and we're able to contact that venue without revealing anyone's identity, we can have a conversation with that venue to say that we've received multiple reports of sexual harassment in this instance in your venue. Is there something specific about the way your venue is set up? Is it the policies and procedures that aren't in place that are enabling this to happen? What is the culture of your venue that's enabling so many incidents of sexual harassment to happen and work with them to recommend policy training there's actually sample policies on our website so it's quite easy and accessible for them to access and implement themselves i do understand though and i must say in the grassroots sector there's a funding issue there where many of the venues won't have the money for funding so we've done schemes um, in liverpool not just because i'm from there but in liverpool where we've worked with a number of venues where we have funded part of the training as well so they can access that um, because it was out of their reach. So it's working with the, the musician community as a whole, including venues, to look at how we can tackle this together. But the support is there from us. And venues are receptive to those conversations, are they? They want to improve. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Venues contact us about this um, proactively in a lot of cases, not just on sexual harassment, but talking about diverse lineups as well. How do we diversify the, the acts that we book? Obviously, that ecosystem leads right up to festival stages, so it's an important part of the conversation. So venues are actively looking to make change. Um, as I said, there's barriers there to do with funding or, or staff. Some venues are run by two people. So obviously that's going to be really difficult to manage, but the willingness is there, it just needs a bit more support. Thank you. Kate. Thanks, Chair. Um, my question is for Lauren, please. Um, can you tell us about the monitoring that you do of festivals that have signed up to the AIF's Charter of Best Practice, please? Um, yes, so um, over 100 festivals have signed up to the Charter. Um, the priority monitoring is making sure that they have published their... So the Charter encourages everybody to follow the best practice and um, adapt it for their own event because everybody is different. So everybody will take the principles and implement them in a way that is suitable for their event. Um, and the Charter requires that you publish that and you make that fully accessible online. Um, and then there's kind of a, a check-in every year uh, post-season to see how the procedures have gone, see what may have worked, what didn't, um, kind of um, sharing knowledge about what one event might have done that was really successful um, or what might, might not have gone quite so well. You know, kind of anecdotally, a lot of people had success with the Ask Angela campaign, using that on their bars. Um, a lot of people um, introduced new welfare spaces where they didn't have them before, kind of specific safe spaces they didn't have before, um, professionals that are trained kind of in mental health and in dealing with those that have been through sexual harassment um, or abuse on site or um, in the wider world. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the processes, I suppose. Um, but it's down to each and every individual to implement what they think is correct for, for their event. And everybody who signed up to it really, really cares and really cares about learning from each other. That's one of the really important things that AIF provides is, is a network so we can all 
improve together. Yeah, so that they sign up and share best practice, etc. But do you check that in any way that staff have undergone training so that they know what to do if they observe or hear uh, uh, sexual violence? Um, well, the AIF is not for profit, and I think there's only two employees, so it's beyond their scope to be kind of on the ground, physically checking that that everything happens in the way that the festival is saying it should. That has to sit on the individual organizer. Okay, and that leads nicely into my next question. Um, we asked Safe Gigs for Women if festivals were supporting them financially. Uh, they said no, despite often being asked to attend. So, in your view, why are festivals not financing them? Um, well, I, I don't actually have an answer to that. Um, Safe Gigs for Women, um, they work directly with AIF. Um, the, the, the Safer Spaces Charter and Policy was developed with Safe Gigs for Women. Um, along with um, UN Women, Rape Crisis England, Good Night Out, um, and Girls Against. Um, so there is communication directly with the people that are experienced and know what they're talking about. Um, but when we talk about financial investment into the safety of our audience, this doesn't just come from working with, with outside organizations. It's, it's an internal procedure. Um, you know, we um, end of the road when we signed the charter, we took this charter as a starting point. Um, we then went away and we worked with uh, UN Women, not Safe Gigs for Women, a different organisation. Um, we put money into that and they helped us develop our procedures and our policies. Um, we invested in the time to train all the heads of department in our procedures and policies and invested in the time for them to then train their departments on site. Um, you know, and there's very, very basic things about safety that you invest in. You invest in good lighting, you invest in good risk assessment. Mm -hmm. It's kind of comparable to what John was saying, you know, in terms of venues, when you notice that there might be repeat venues that are problematic, you have to ask yourself, okay, why is that happening on that particular spot, part of site? Is there an alley with toilets that's poorly lit? Like, what do we need to do about that? And it's when it's working with security companies um, and making sure that you're spending your money on security with the best possible company out there and um, I know it's been spoken about in this committee before but there is a serious skill shortage um, with security companies um, so the kind of the investment in the ecosystem of making safe uh, safer spaces at festivals comes from all different directions it comes from investing in a diverse workforce and everything Marta was talking about um, yeah. Okay, so kind of specifically around volunteer groups, should funding be a condition uh, of festivals being a signatory to the Charter, do you think? Funding volunteer groups? Yeah, should funding of the volunteer groups be a condition of festivals being a signatory to the AIF's Charter? Um, no, I think the government at wide should be funding these organisations. Um, not-for-profit organisations have the expertise, they don't necessarily have the same red tape and they already know what they're doing, they lack the resources. Um, I, I would love to see it come from within and I am open to those conversations, no one has brought those conversations to me. Um, but I do think that the independent sector is woefully underfunded. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks Chair. Can I just ask a question, Lauren? When and I think you use the phrase "make sure that you're working with the best security companies." How do you go about determining that? What are the the measures that you use, both in terms of accreditation, but also in terms of sharing experiences with other festivals, who are good and who are bad? Well, you've hit the nail on the head in the kind of the last point. You you share information with other festivals about who's done a good job. Um, 
You do your due diligence on the company, take professional recommendations, you take personal recommendations, and you make sure that um, they all have the correct training in place. Um, but I do think that the training that um, security go through, you know, you have to go through SIA training to get your badge. I think that there are massive holes in that training. Um, I think a lot of the issues with um, security could be solved by plugging the holes in those training. Um, bringing in these organisations that we've spoken about, like Girls Against Good Night Out, Safe Gigs for Women, to inform a more detailed and survivor-led orientated package as part of that licence. Because if we knew the professionals that turn up on site who are supposed to have already gone through this training, we retrain them how we like to do things. But if we knew that they were already arriving with like a higher standard of professionalism in this area, it would be a massive, massive relief. You use the phrase holes in their training, the gaps. Um, I'm not necessarily going to ask you to list what those gaps are here and now, but I think it would be useful for us to you know, just have an idea of the examples of that because that could very well be an area in which we wanted to make recommendations as to how for accreditation for licensing that training needs to be improved. I can certainly provide some answers in writing afterwards but for now I can certainly say that it's very outdated um, and it's definitely not um, survivor-led. Um, and it's definitely coming from a world that is very male dominated. <laughs> the security industry is incredibly male dominated and incredibly white. Thank you for that. Caroline. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Um, I'm going to focus on you, John. I apologise. Uh, I want to talk to you about the music industry more generally. So you'll be aware that uh, a few years ago, in response to some of the concerns around um, misogyny and uh, sexual harassment and bullying and what have you within the sector, the uh, Musicians Union, alongside the Independent Society for Musicians, set up a, um, a code of practice uh, so we took evidence the other day from the chief executive of the ISM who told us that this code of practice that they developed in partnership with you had been, and I'm going to quote this, a resounding failure because the industry, and I'm going to quote it again, doesn't take much notice of codes. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know what, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree. We've had over 50 signatories of code. The problem for me is not the code. The problem is, is what Kate pointed out before. The code isn't monitored. The code isn't enforced in any way. Basically, we haven't got the resources to be able to do it. So we do get signatories to the, the Code of Practice, which outlines acceptable behaviour and standards that we expect to see in the music industry. What we've got with the Code is something to hold people accountable to, so organisations. So where we do receive reports, as I spoke about earlier, we can then contact them and provide recommendations for training and policy, or if necessary, take them off the, the list of signatories. In terms of the impact that has in the industry, I can't imagine that's very severe or, or people will take that much notice of being removed from a signatory. What we are working on at the moment is a revised code of practice with the BPI, the Ivers Academy and UK Music, which will be much more overarching, be supported by training and be much more robust code. Um, there's also the anti-racism code of conduct that's been <coughs> creation from Black Lives in Music. I know Sharice was on, on the first session. Mm. That is going to be much more robust. That will be monitored by Black Lives in Music and again supported by training. So yeah, whilst I don't disagree, I don't think it was a complete waste of time, but I don't think it had the impact that we would have hoped. And this sort of whole area of kind of enforcement, how it's monitored, how mm -hmm. it's enforced, how it can be sort of... Um, what the kind of checks and balances can be that you know used against those that aren't enforcing the code. To what extent? I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a, a multi, multi million pound industry in you know at its highest levels. Uh, so one would have hoped that the industry could find a way to find to um, to to come together and put in place the systems and processes to be able to enforce that quite robustly you know and, and, and amongst itself because it's good for the industry right yeah uh, particularly given that it's um that so many of your consumers are so young and impressionable so to what extent do you think it's up to the music industry yourselves and and and, and others to to put in place this um these systems and to what extent do you think the government's got a role to get involved yeah, I think um, 
as you pointed out, both have got a role. And as you know, that um, most of the industry, certainly the people who are working with, like the BPI, UK Music, um, have been involved from the beginning in the Creative Independent Standards Authority, and we'll be supporting that. So we've supported it from the creation, and we'll support it when it launches as well. Again, because of the issues you pointed out, it's a multi-million pound industry. The issue I think that we have it, it uh, um, there's lots of different sectors of the industry and lots of different ways of working, staffed by freelancers, and each they won't necessarily be that different, but there'll be nuances within each sector. So we'll be looking for sectorial expertise from the education sector, the classical world, the live industry, festival, so we can really address those problems properly. Um, and that's where I think it's the music industry's responsibility, being part of that group that's um, helping to launch the Creative Independent Standards Authority. Where the government has got a role to play is in legislation. So as I pointed out before, the, um, the Worker Protection Bill, we're really interested to see that pass with third well, part. Yeah. the Worker Protection Bill. Right. I think I think that's passing through the House of Parliament currently. Um, I think there's been some issues with it around the third party protection harassment. We're really keen to see that pass for the for the reasons that I pointed out before. Um, the other issue that we have with our members is that some of the way, oh, as I've pointed out before, 90% of our members work in a freelance capacity and because of the way that they work, some of them fall through the gaps in legislation of the protections that the Equality Act for, um, affords. So when they come to us for legal advice on discrimination or sexual harassment, we find ourselves in a position where there's no legal route to justice. We've got a campaign about it called Protect Freelancers Too that I would recommend that you take a look at if you haven't seen it already. So they're some of the ways I think the government can help. Obviously there's wide issues when we look at representation of women in the music industry so not just the safety and that feeds into the conversation that we were having earlier about why don't we see more women in headline slots um, am I jumping ahead with my questions now uh, on <laughs> jumping no you're not jumping ahead don't you worry no, carry on. so I mean the the I work with a lot of, of, of women members obviously my, my job and um, Safety is one of the major concerns that they come to us with. The second concern and a barrier, what we see about representation of women in the music industry is childcare and the way that works for freelancers. So um, it, it's especially difficult when women go on tour as well. So freelancers' working schedule, a freelance musician's working schedule can change day by day and the location can change quite often. So it leaves parents with childcare. Um, it, it, when they've booked childcare, it can often leave them with childcare that they don't need and then they've got to scrabble around to rearrange the childcare again. Um, and the last minute nature of freelance bookings means that women with care and responsibilities have got to work out these super complex childcare arrangements before they commit to a job. Whereas someone without children haven't, and people without children tend to be men or, or younger women. Um, so research from Parents in Performing Arts is an organisation called Parents and Carers in Performing Arts, sorry, found that nine out of ten mothers and female carers working in the industry are the primary carers uh, of children. Um, and that same research found that over 45% of women had turned down jobs often because of care and responsibilities. So that's not a choice that women are actively making. That's a, a consequence of a lack of structures to support women with childcare obligations in the music industry. And with that is affordable, flexible, high quality childcare that just doesn't exist for our members. And where it does exist, it's out of the cost for most of our members as well. So we'll see that as another barrier to, to women being visible or being able to progress their careers in the music industry. If I may, I would like to add, yes, of course, please. Uh, there is a wonderful association in, in Spain and I know that they are watching right now, it's called Mujeres de la Industria de la Musica, Women in the Music Business, and they did a study last year that tackles exactly this kind of mm -hmm. issues. And I think that the numbers are absolutely astonishing because only 33% of women in music business against uh, 48 percent, 33 to 48, we have kids. Uh, so 48 percent of the working force in Spain, female working force, has kids and only 33 percent in music business has kids. We have to think why is that? It's something that is inherently wrong and it doesn't help us to have kids uh, when the difference is so, so, so big. So I, I think that that's, again, another huge barrier, as John was saying, uh, when we decide that the, we want to work and, uh, in this business. And that's why, also, increasingly, we have younger uh, women working in, uh, in music. Uh, it's very good news that we have younger generations joining us. But why we decide that it's over for us when we top 
40 years old or something like that, then we can't access senior roles because maybe we decide that it's now or never, we want to have kids. So then we have to say goodbye to our jobs in order to have a family that involves also children. So I, I think that's something that definitely it's a huge uh, issue when we want to have senior uh, task forces that also involve women, and um, therefore that we can make decisions. But, but I mean, John, you make the point that the ready availability of flexible, affordable childcare is at the root of this problem, and I would disagree, and I would um, counter that. I mean, I, I don't disagree that that is a yeah. problem, but that's not just a problem for the music industry, that's a, a problem for women right across the country, right? Um, and yet the music industry has a particular problem mm -hmm. retaining its female workforce. And I would suggest to you that actually one of the reasons, and, um, and to Marsha as well, that having a lack of women higher up the sort of food chain in decision-making roles also means an industry which is not making policies that are geared towards their female workforces. Um, so to, to, you know, to what extent uh, are you putting in place measures that could actually help, help that pipeline? I mean, we've heard so much evidence from, uh, from those within the music industry across sectors, you know, from classical music right the way through to and everything in between uh, that, uh, that says, you know, you kind of almost have to put up with, with so much negativity and so much bad treatment. And if you, if you, you know, you don't even bother to report it or bother to stand up to it because that's the end of your career, you're, you know, you're done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what can be done to overcome that? I mean, it's, it's going back to that point about freelancers and them informal working networks as well. So I would completely agree with you that in, in some respects there isn't policy and practice in place. Where we've got collective bargaining agreements, so with employed musicians, where there's definitely policy and practice in place. So what you would expect to see from an employer in terms of maternity leave. What I'm talking about is the freelance who will rely on the childcare sector to provide that flexible um, ad hoc childcare. That, that's the bit that I'm saying is the barrier to our members. So yeah, where we've got collective bargaining agreements, you will see better maternity um, and parental leave policies. Where the freelance work for is, it's impossible for us to have those agreements. So you won't see the same and they're relying on um, the childcare that exists outside of employment, let's say. To, to be able to do that. Um, but again, going back to why women don't raise their heads, of course, it's that freelance nature again, is the minute someone raises a problem, whether that be sexual harassment, lack of facilities for women, discrimination, generally what we'll see at the MU is that they become the problem. So that the, the person who's complaining, the woman in this instance, is forced out of the workforce or victimised. Um, um, we quite often see the perpetrators stay in the workforce and move up the workforce. Um, yeah, it's a massive problem for us. But even outside of the freelancer world, even mm -hmm. within the industry where people are employees, yes. I mean, we still have an issue here. I mean, you know, a four percent reference to four percent reference to supportive employer. Yeah, I mean, that's not good. No, uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and it and, and, and this is for um, childcare, but it's also for maternity um, issues as well. I mean, surely this is this is because there are a lack, a lack of women in these decision-making capabilities that are not bringing forward women-friendly uh, policies within the business. What mm. can you do to, what can the industry itself do to address it and what, could, what should the government do to address it? I mean, we talk about this a lot, about the lack of women in leadership positions. Um, and again, I think that would be a game changer in terms of the way the, way the workplace was set up. Women have got the lived experience of the things that they need. We'll be able to inform that. So we're, again, there's Key Change is an organisation working specifically with festivals to look at 50-50 gender balance. I think it started off specifically at festivals, but now Key Change is much wider, isn't it? Looking at organisations, you've got organisations, I think she's gave evidence, Nadia Khan from Women in Control, who look at... Um, representation of women on boards and we work with lots of these organisations to make sure that women are in leadership positions and in decision making capacities as well. Um, so those organisations do exist and we've been encouraging the industry to work with them. Um, I would like to come in on yes, this as do. well. Um, AIF is similar, but, you know, we, we put a lot of work into making sure that the board has a good gender balance um, and End of the Road does similar. Um, our workforce is about 63% female, um, a lot of them occupying roles that are a, a lot of the time considered more male in terms of production staff, engineers, head of technical. Um, I think it has to start kind of it has to start somewhere and organisations like the MU, like the AIF can kind of lead lead that way. Um, I think it's 
it's based on directors and organizers alone, but I think it's 48 0.48% of AIF's kind of members are, are female, so that's nearly half of the organization's festivals being female-led. Um, and I think supporting those organizations to make that change so it can be seen, because that's that's the important thing, isn't it, for somebody to see somebody that looks like them um, doing a role that they want to be able to do. Um, and just coming back to childcare, I, I want to flag that I think the music industry has a very specific issue in that the hours that are expected mm -hmm. are, are very antisocial. They're outside of your normal nine to fives. You're expected to be up late, probably drinking to be sociable. You're expected to work at the weekends. Um, and I think those with uh, childcare needs that have to, you know, that prioritise um, family or need to stay at home because they can't find good childcare, they begin to feel invisible in the industry and they begin to doubt their worth or their contribution. Um, and then they do also become more invisible and then you're lacking representation again and it's a whole kind of cycle. To what extent do you just think there's a, there's a sense of... I'm going to use the word arrogance. It's probably not the word I'm really searching for, but to what extent is there just an arrogance at the top of the industry that kind of says um, all this sort of uh, sexual equality, all this sort of, you know, focusing on uh, on rooting out, you know, um, bullying, all this focus on trying to push equality, which doesn't really apply to us? Mm, I, think, I think there is a lot of arrogance. Um, a, a around that, I think these issues exist everywhere. And even if you're an organisation that feels like you're doing well, you're never going to be doing well enough. There's always more that you can be doing. Um, I think with all forms of kind of prejudice and discrimination, a lot of the time, no real change is going to happen unless people are willing to give up the power that they have at the top to make that change possible. And just finally, before I shut up. Um, is there anything else that you think the government could or should be doing besides the things you've already mentioned that would, it would move the dial on this? I really think that paternity leave in this country is, is insufficient. Mm -hmm. I think it's based on a very outdated idea of, of kind of women or child bearers as the caregivers um, and supporting partner as the provider. Um, so a lot of... I. I know from kind of people that I've worked with, they are the ones who end up taking maternity leave. They are the ones that end up looking after the children because it's financially better for them as a couple to do so. And I really think that that is something that should be addressed. Yeah, I mean, there's a role for government and within sectors on that because there's some sort of, there is a kind of stigma about guys who take paternity leave as well. In, in may many I, cases. may yes, I of add course, to John, that? Please. Thank you. Just two, two other issues that are raised quite frequently from our female members is um, the way maternity allowance applies to the self-employed and the keeping in touch days is only 10 days. Um, which a lot of our female members say that's not enough to sustain the careers while they're on maternity leave. Um, it's different to being employed, isn't it? The, the freelance musicians need to stay on fixers and bookers' radars, and that means working regularly for them. If not, they'll just drop off and we perpetuate the problem. Um, so that's one another issue that's being raised. The issue of shared parental leave for freelancers as well. So self-employed parents aren't eligible for shared parental pay. So that current system of maternity allowance places the entire burden of childcare on the woman um, and offers no financial support to, to the partner who might like to ch share some of the childcare. And as I've just explained, that flexibility of childcare for a freelance musician is crucial if they're to keep the business afloat while they're on maternity leave. So yeah. there's definitely two, two points there that I would add to that. Martin, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, well, as a recent mother myself, um, I, I feel that I'm... Definitely very lucky because my situation is not at all what I can see uh, around me. I'm not a freelancer and as John was saying, that's huge because of course then I can count off on uh, the, 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 the support system uh, behind me. Um, and also I think that somehow when motherhood hits, when you are already on a senior, in a senior position, it's way better, it's way easier. But if you just want to start a career, then you're going to commit, you're going to say no to so many things. Um, the same study that I was mentioning uh, before, 
um, from Mujeres en la Industria de la Música, 81% of uh, women working in music in Spain, 81% um, said that uh, they were gonna um, give up on something. Uh, having children, having a personal life, or getting a raise because they had to take care of, um, I don't know, uh, a sick parent or something like that. Um, and that's, that's huge, the way that uh, our social and family um, environment affects us only as women. It's, uh, it's tremendous. It doesn't have anything to do with, uh, with men, and I can see that in my, in, my, in my environment. I consider myself uh, very, very lucky, but that's definitely not um, the, the usual thing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Two things. So, Lauren, um, I think you made a really, really pertinent point about antisocial hours late at night. Um, irregular as well. We all know with childcare providers, they want to have a kind of a consistent customer, nine till five, five days a week. Uh, are the festivals themselves doing anything to make sure that female artists, technicians, can bring children to festivals and find childcare? Um, I can't speak to the wider climate um, because I don't have that knowledge, but I can speak to End of the Road. Um, and yes, we do. Um, we provide um, extra passes for carers to come with parents. Um, sometimes we provide extra accommodation, so extra caravans, extra boutique tents. Um, to make sure that if you are working over the festival and you have childcare responsibilities, that they can kind of be tied in together. You don't necessarily have to leave um, your child kind of at home or with a carer or with grandparents, which is often the way that a lot of people I know kind of get by. So, so yes, those those options are there for for parents in at end of the road. Thank you for that. Very helpful. Um, and. Do you perceive that there is a difference between festivals, and I'm going to use the term, led by women? Do they make more accommodations? Um, kind of there has to be, I think, as, as with anything that's led by a lived experience. Like, I'm not a mother, but I, I'm a woman, and I think that perspective comes into play. Um, and I think that's why it's really important to have that representation at, at the top level. Um, to have somebody that really knows what it's like to go through those things or at least have those people in senior positions within your organisation, even if they're not at the top. And do you think it also makes a difference when looking at issues around safety of female festival goers, the efforts that go into making sure that there are sufficient safe spaces, that there are properly trained security? Is Are you aware of a difference that when there are women at the top of organisations, they make more of an effort to make sure that happens? Where of a difference? <clears throat> I don't know. I, again, I can only speak to yeah, my, no, speak myself. From your... um, yes, because we've... I don't know anybody in this industry that hasn't been through some form of sexual harassment or abuse or discrimination based on their gender or sexuality or ethnic background. Um, so yes, I think we all, if we've been through that, then we, we care more. Thank you. Elliot. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much, panel. Um, John, I'd like to come to you, if I may, on the issue of non-disclosure agreements um, and NDAs. This has been something that's been flagged up throughout the course of, of this inquiry. Um, we've had uh, evidence both from Dr. Cassandra Jones, but also from the chief executive of ISM, citing the use of non-disclosure agreements and NDAs as a as a reason um, and as a factor for bullying and harassment in, in the industry and the inability to report. Now, this is where I think um, the committee is very keen to get a better idea because, of course, NDAs aren't supposed to be used for um, covering up crimes, essentially. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. Um, in your experience in the industry, how commonplace is the use of NDAs um, specifically um, on the issue of abuse and things that should be 
classified as criminal, but also more widely in terms of poor behaviour um, and things that might not necessarily pass the, the sniff test, if you could call it that. Um, how commonplace have you found it and, and how and why in your experience are they used? It's obviously difficult to say how commonplace it is mm. because a lot of NDAs will stop members talking to us mm. a, a, about it. But I do know from working with members that um, NDAs are used for exactly the way you've described. Mm. Um, quite often used to hide discriminatory behaviour, unlawful behaviour, sexual harassment or assault. Mm. Um, and quite often used to allow perpetrators to stay in the workplace or move from workplace to workplace with impunity. And, and the person who's experienced sexual harassment or discriminatory behaviour is often can't work with that person again for obvious reasons. So they're the ones who, who are suffering this. Um, again, I couldn't speak to how widespread they use because of the issue of NDAs. I can tell you what we would like to see is, is in, in the use of NDAs yeah, yeah. is similar actions to those that have recently been taken in higher education. Um, I think it's really recent, that's happened in February, where they've been yeah. prohibited for the use of um, covering up sexual harassment or discrimination. Mm -hmm. We'd love to see a similar mechanism in place for the music industry, well or more widely, to stop mm -hmm. the misuse sorry, of NDAs. Mm -hmm. And as, as things stand, so I'm, I was going to ask you what, what the government should do, so you've answered that question, okay. thank you. Um, but the, um, so, um, so, but as, as things stand, if, if one of your female members came to you, um, what, what would your advice be to them um, at the moment, or, would you, or, or are you tied by the state, of, the state of play at the moment, unless there's legislative change? We'd need legislative change, and it, mm. it depend, again, it would be, um, mm. in some cases, if, if the NDA was there to protect our member, to mm. protect our member's identity, then 100% if that's what our member wanted. Mm. So again, we'd be led by the actions of our member, but yeah, we, we would need legislation, we need help with this. Mm. No, thank you for that, and um, that was um, very succinct, so thank you, Chair. <laughs> thank you very much. Can I just thank all of our witnesses for the evidence that you've given this afternoon? It's been hugely appreciated. Lauren, I think we threw quite a few things that we'd love you to follow up uh, in writing. Uh, if either of the other two witnesses feel that there is anything that you would like to add in writing after the session, please do so. Uh, but thank you very much for the information that you've given us today. Order, order. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.
the proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.